Welcome, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking uh, about the research I've been doing um, in the vicinity of Winslow, Arizona, in northeastern Arizona for the last 45 years, really 35 with the Arizona State Museum. And uh, this area is where the Hopi live, and the Hopi have uh, strong connections to this area going back deep in history. And I want to share this uh, quote with you about the perspectives the Hopi have on coming into this world and how they record their migrations through it. I'll go ahead and read this, even though uh, through Zoom, I know you can read it for, for yourselves. The Hopi emerged into this world, the fourth world, following travels through earlier worlds characterized by disorder and corruption. Upon emergence, Hopi ancestors encountered Masao, a guardian deity. Masao allowed the Hopi to live on this land if they agreed to be humble farmers who served as stewards of the earth. He instructed the Hopi to travel the world in search of their rightful place, leaving footprints as evidence of their journey. As Hopi ancestors moved and lived throughout the land, gaining important knowledge of places and resources, they left material traces as physical evidence that they had vested the land with their spiritual stewardship and fulfilled their pact with Masao. So basically, this is just saying that uh, Hopi and their ancestors left items, objects, material culture purposely on the landscape as representations of their being there in the past and to claim that and to also help them remember that uh, they did this journey and who they were on this journey. So um, the area that we're going to be focusing on is illustrated in this map. There are two parts of this. The first one is what's called the Rock Art Ranch Research Area. RAR stands for Rock Art Ranch. Um, and you can see it connects on the west side with Chevlon Canyon. I'll have a slide of that in a moment. Uh, this is an area uh, that we worked on, the Arizona State Museum and the Mullaby Research Program from 2011 to 2016 as a field school with the Anth School of Anthropology at the U of A. And we worked on this private ranch because nothing is known about this area archaeologically. It's because it, there are so many private ranches here, uh, there's been no professional archaeological work done in this area. And it's so close to the area where you can see there are a number of big pueblos labeled as Homolavi and Chevlon, areas that we did our research from 1985 to 2006. And these pueblos um, have strong roots to the Hopi. Hopi consider these to be ancestral homes. Homolavi means place of hills or buttes. And the Rock Art Ranch is only about three and a half or four miles from Chevlon Ruin, the closest of these pueblos. And so this might give us some insights into the uh, relationship of people living in this area to those who eventually lived in these big pueblos. Uh, so this is a view of Chevlon Canyon. As you can see, it is deeply incised and narrow. And the most important feature is it has a permanent flow of water from several springs a few miles up or south of this area. Uh, those springs and this water provides unique plants and animals. Uh, and this is also an area where uh, petroglyphs have been carved for thousands of years. And I'll have some slides of that in a little while. So this is a very important place because water is so scarce in this landscape. Um, any place that it occurs naturally is a sacred place to the people living in this area. So this is on the western edge of Rock Art Ranch. And this stream flows right along Chevron Pueblo a few miles downstream. So um, the people living at the big Pueblos, the Homolavi Pueblos, were dedicated farmers. Um, but prior to people being farmers and spending most of their time growing corn, beans, and squash, 
Before the introduction of corn into this area 4,000 years ago, people were hunters and gatherers. And we know archeologically that the people began settling in this area or using this area more than 13,000 years ago. And these groups are mobile. In other words, they have to follow the resources as they're available, wherever there are plants, grasses, game, big game, small game, people move to those areas to get those resources and those resources change seasonally and from year to year. So these poop people move across the landscape. Um, and we know from studies of ethnographic groups of mobile uh, hunters and gatherers that these people recognize elements of their landscape as uh, using cultural markers on the landscape. So they recognize places and they attach important cultural significance to these places. This is called placemaking by anthropologists. And in addition to cultural features such as Chevron Canyon, um, there might be natural features such as ruins in the area or objects in the area. In the Rock Art Ranch area, uh, we believe that placemaking included not only Chevron Canyon, but the petroglyphs that are in the canyon and the projectile points that these hunters and gatherers used for hunting. At the Mulvey area where the Pueblos are, we believe that the placemaking included the buttes, the hamals that uh, this area is named after, and the river and petroglyphs in this area as well. So these are all ways of marking the landscape for subsequent generations of people coming through the area to know who was there in the past, to connect with those people, and to recognize that this is a known place and an important place to people in the past. Steps at Chevron Canyon is, uh, this is a picture on the lower left of the Chevron where we saw a close up earlier on. This is what the actual course of the canyon looks like. And it is very windy, not as linear at all. And the area where the petroglyphs are located is surrounded in the uh, green oval. And this is just one example of the petroglyphs. These are the earlier ones that date from about 6,000 to 1,000 BCE or BC. And these are the earliest petroglyphs in the canyon. And these are being left there as markers in the canyon and also indicating how important the canyon is to these people. Um, later on, when these groups acquired corn and began doing small scale farming, uh, the types of petroglyphs they carved became much more elaborate because they were spending more time in an area. Um, the gatherings were larger. Um, and so uh, this is called the Basket Maker II period in this region. Um, and this goes from about uh, 3,000 years ago to about 1,400 years ago. And these petroglyphs are quite large. Uh, the one on the right is about five feet high and is of a person. The one on the left is about four feet high and is of a, a woman giving birth. Uh, there are over 3,000 of these glyphs in Chevron Canyon. Again, taking place over a period of 7,000 or more years. So make, indicating this is a very important place for a long period of time. Um, in our, we were aware of these petroglyph sites uh, early on in our work in the region, starting for me in the 1970s. And I wanted to begin working in this area around the petroglyphs because of the antiquity of the petroglyphs. We as archeologists thought there must be archeological sites associated with these. Where are these sites? How big are they? And what can we learn from these sites about the people who are living in the area and that were carving these petroglyphs? So you can see that uh, over a course of six years from 2011 to 2016, 
we recorded 184 sites in about a six square mile area. Uh, one of the results of this is that we found uh, almost 100 of these sites predate the introduction of pottery, which is about 600 AD in this area. So these are all the sites that are associated with the majority of the petroglyphs in the canyon, 90% of them. And you can, the petroglyphs are the blue, blue box, which I have the arrow pointed at, that's where the petroglyph site is. And Bell Cow and Chimney Canyons are two major canyons that go through the ranch and eventually intersect with either Chevron Canyon or the Little Colorado River. And the sites are located very close to these canyons. This is Chimney Canyon. Um, not very impressive, I must admit, but um, it's important because it carried water through the area and in the sands underneath the surface of the canyon, there's abundant water about four or five feet down that could have been tapped through shallow wells also, it supported um, larger trees, many of which provided food for um, people who were hunters and gatherers, as well as early farmers. A uh, more impressive canyon is Bell Cow Canyon. You can see some of the larger trees in this area. Uh, these would include things such as walnut trees and willow trees and cottonwood trees, all of which produce edible uh, fruits and seeds. And again, these areas could have, what, this area also had uh, abundant water beneath the sandy surface. And during the rainy season, which we hope will be coming soon to Arizona in July, August, and September, there's sometimes a standing water in these areas that would have been valuable for the groups who were spending time in the area hunting and gathering. Um, so I mentioned that we collected uh, two, almost 250 projectile points and arrowheads in, in our six years of work in the area. Um, this is a summary of those by time period, going back uh, 13,000 or more years with Paleo Indian, all the way up to uh, 1600 AD or CE. Um, and you can see the distribution of points through all of these different time periods having representations from almost every single one. Uh, this indicates the length of occupation and use of this area over a 13,000 year period. I also want to point out that uh, uh, almost 30% of these points are made out of petrified wood. And petrified wood is not locally available at Rock Art Ranch. That's what the RER stands for, by the way. Um, it's only available about 30 miles away at what's called the Petrified Forest National Park uh, today, uh, which is where there are large uh, logs of petrified wood that were used extensively by uh, pre-Hispanic groups. So tremendous range of time um, and these are some of those examples of those points. Uh, I might note that these two on the upper left are Clovis bases. Uh, Clovis points are the er earliest points in um, North America that we know of. Um, and the other points in this, these are other paleo points. These are archaic period points in the middle row and the bottom row represents best maker period and Pueblo period points. Um, so uh, I should also note that the Clovis points are made out of petrified woods, which indicates that they were made from a fairly local source, only 30 miles away. So these people were not only moving through the area and hunting a large um, extinct game in, uh, in the area, but they were also uh, provisioning by getting stone resources in the area as well, so they could create new points. Um, so what, one of the things about coming and going through this area, projectile points can help us understand this a little bit because we know from archeological work 
over the last hundred or so years where many of these points are coming from, at least where the most, most of them are being manufactured and brought from, where the people who make them are coming from originally. So these uh, ellipticals highlight some of those. Uh, for the Paleo-Indian period, um, we can see that most of them are coming from the east, from New what is today New Mexico, although a few are coming from the Great Basin area in the north and northwest. Um, later on, um, we'll see that points are coming from different directions um, in later periods, but predominantly the points are coming from the east. So groups are coming into the middle of Colorado Rock Art Ranch area from all different directions. Um, they are coming into this area probably because it's attractive because of Chevron Canyon other resources in the area uh, like animals and plants and that this area is known far and wide by these groups and they're coming there and they're leaving their spear points projectile points as indicators that they've been there um, which is what we think is part of what's going on with all these points so the paleo indian points those that are uh, 13,000 to about 9,000 years old. Uh, this is their distribution on the ranch. Uh, again, this is the Petrocle site. And these two uh, brown, I guess, pentagons are areas where they can, uh, the hunters and gatherers can also collect stone sources, primarily chert and some igneous stones that they can use to make uh, tools and projectile points. So another attraction to this area, in addition to uh, the water and the plants associated with that and the small canyons, which also provide plants and are attractive to animals, there's also stone sources, not petrified wood, but other stone sources that they could use to uh, replenish their supplies for uh, hunting. Um, so these are the Paleo-Indian points, some of them. We have 31 that we've collected from the ranch, which is just unbelievable. Again, these are all from the surface. Uh, Clovis points at the top, um, plain view points, which are uh, almost contemporary with Clovis points in the middle row. Uh, Eden points, which are, uh, come from generally Colorado, Wyoming, and that area. Um, and then uh, Agate Basin points, which also come from the Northeast. And then this, these interesting Great Basin stem points, which are the two on the bottom right. Um, those are uh, possibly contemporary with Clovis points, and those come from the Northwest, as far as Washington and Oregon and down into Nevada and Utah. So this is kind of a summary of what I've just been talking about. These are where people are coming from into the Rock Art Ranch in this sort of middle little Colorado area where they're coming from. Um, and in some cases bringing material uh, from long distances uh, that these stones are made, these points are made out of, um, or sometimes uh, collecting material nearby such as the petrified wood. Again, most of it is not made from materials in the Rock Art Ranch area. So they're coming from many areas, maybe interacting with one another, maybe using it at different points in time. Uh, we don't know, but um, it's certainly an area that is being widely used and it's widely known uh, in the earliest times in the, of human occupation in this area. Moving through time, um, in the early and middle archaic, this is from about seven, seven or 8,000 years ago to about five or four to 5,000 years ago. And this is the distribution of sites. Oops. And uh, these sites, again, are concentrated um, along the Belkow Canyon, Chevron Canyon area, where resources are the richest. But there are also a few sites on Long Chimney Canyon, but again, they're focused on canyons because uh, the resources they're interested in, hunting and gathering, and also seeds, 
um, are uh, available in these areas. And these are some of the points that we've recovered. Um, these are what are called Bahada points, which are the, some of the earliest archaic points. Uh, the one on the left is made out of petrified wood. Uh, the one in the middle is made out of local uh, chert. And the one on the uh, right is made from a non-local chert. And these are other types of middle archaic points. Uh, Northern Sidenost on the left, Pinto on the lower right, San Jose uh, on the upper part of the screen. And so they're abundant. Uh, these groups are visiting this area frequently. And you'll notice how many of these points, again, are whole. Um, so I, I, my thinking is that these whole points are being left there purposely. I, I don't think when you're throwing a spear that you, uh, it's going so far that you can't go and retrieve the point if you miss or if it goes into something. Um, so I think the whole points are purposely left to indicate the identity of people who were there. So uh, a lot of these are petrified wood, shirts, um, the white colored points, the, the one in the upper part of the screen is probably also petrified wood. And so these early middle archaic points are coming from all different directions. Um, primarily, again, from the east, but also from the north uh, with the, uh, the side nose tradition. And a lot of them from the west, from the deserts of uh, western Arizona, um, eastern California with the, the Pinto tradition. So uh, even more diverse groups are coming in, even more intensive use of the area during this period. Um, and this illustrates uh, just how intensive that use is, where these groups are coming in. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to talk about the petroglyph tradition, which is highlighted in the groups coming from the Glen Canyon area in southeastern Utah during the archaic period. But look at the huge number of points coming in from the east, including nine petrified wood points from the petrified forest area, um, also petrified wood from the Pinto complex, from the northern side knots. So again, these groups are coming from long distances and different areas, but they're also uh, reprovisioning using local resources. Um, then we move through time in the late archaic and early agricultural period. This is a period from about 3,000, maybe 3,500 years ago uh, to about um, 1,500 years ago. Uh, still a huge focus on the canyons, uh, a few more people along Chimney Canyon, but the, the focus of occupation and use is still along Belkow Canyon. Um, these groups um, are using the area for longer periods of time, more intensively. Uh, a lot of these sites have features on them, uh, cysts and features that are burned. Um, I collected samples from a half a dozen of these burned features, uh, which we converted to radiocarbon dates. And these are some of the radiocarbon dates we have. Uh, you can see some of them go as early as 800 BC um, and they run as late as uh, 550 AD. So uh, a span of 13, 1400 years in these radiocarbon dates um, focused still um, along Belkow Canyon. So this is the period when these groups were, get, were beginning to farm. Um, this is one of those features that I collected the sample from. Uh, this one dating to about uh, 2,000 years ago. Interestingly, none of these samples had corn in it. So it's possible that these groups were, even though that they were beginning to do some farming, mostly of maize, um, squash and beans typically came in a little bit later. Um, but when they were coming to Rock Art Ranch, they weren't coming there to farm. They were coming there for uh, seeds and other plants and hunting and gathering. 
And these are some of the later cake points, um, which we have lots and lots. San Pedro points on the left. Uh, San Pedro is named after the San Pedro River in the Tucson area. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And the uh, datal points, which are quite similar to San Pedro and uh, are more associated with the east rather than the south. So um, in the case of the later cake basket maker period, the uh, direction that groups are coming from is shifted to the south and continuing from the east, but there are actually quite a few more now coming from the south. And this is the first time that that's shown up. Uh, previously, it's been primarily from the east and a little bit from the west uh, and north and east. Now the south shows up. And what's going on with this? Well, um, there are many archaeologists who have speculated, and I think most now will accept the close relationship between groups living in what is today's Tucson in the San Pedro, Santa Cruz uh, River areas uh, in the Tucson area, uh, which is what is called the San Pedro Cochise by archaeologists. The relationship of these people living in our area to groups living on the Colorado Plateau in western, north, northeastern Arizona, the western basket maker area. And this is based on similarities in projectile points, which you can see here. Uh, but also, interestingly, uh, very similar to identical ways of weaving basketry. And this type of uh, basketry weaving is something that is a tech, what we call technological style. It's something that wouldn't be copied by another group because it's so intricately hidden underneath the surface of the basket. Uh, groups who were making this would only be able to do this if they had learned from groups who were already making this. So this suggests that people in the San Pedro Cochise actually moved to the western uh, basket maker area in northeastern Arizona rather than that technology being borrowed. There are also similarities in uh, the way they make their uh, houses, their pit houses. So going back to uh, petroglyphs now, um, the archaic petroglyphs and basket maker two petroglyphs are the two traditions that we see in Chevron Canyon. Um, we also see these traditions along the San Juan River um, along the Arizona-Utah border. Uh, interestingly, according to experts who have looked at the petroglyphs, and I am not an expert, so I'm relying on those people, the archaic petroglyphs, which we see here on the left side of this slide and on the left side of the earlier slide, which I'm showing, those petroglyph traditions are almost identical, indicating that uh, the archaic groups were moving through these areas in long distances in contact with one another. Um, in contrast to the um, Basket Maker II petroglyphs, which we see on the right on both slides, um, people who have studied the petro Basket Maker II petroglyphs in the Little Colorado area and the Chevron Canyon area contend that they're very different and distinctive from those in the Glen Canyon area, suggesting that the groups making them are distinct groups from those in uh, southeastern Utah, northeastern Arizona. That would fit in with the idea that, that these groups are coming from different areas, uh, which is supported by the projectile points and the basketry. So uh, the late archaic uh, Best Maker II period, we have uh, groups coming from the south, the east, and we have the shared archaic, early archaic or late archaic tradition coming from the north, but there's a different Best Maker II tradition in terms of petroglyphs, which is more local. Another thing that um, 
is very important about understanding what these people were doing during this, especially the Basque maker period, but also during the archaic tradition, is the fact that we have found hundreds and hundreds of matates and manos. Uh, for those of you who may not know, manos matates are what are used to grind seeds and eventually corn. Um, these matatis and manos come from local sources at Rock Art Ranch, and uh, the, their configuration as either flat or basin is associated with their being used by pre-corn grinding groups uh, and probably being used to grind seeds. And uh, work that we've done in the area by Karen Adams, who collected plants from the region, she found uh, 14 different grass seeds are currently growing at Rock Art Ranch, and there were probably many more before cattle grazing was introduced in the area. So the fact that we're finding so many pieces of ground stone associated with basket maker sites with burned features, storage cysts, and things like that indicates that these groups may be more focused on the gathering part of hunting and gathering rather than the hunting part of the hunting and gathering during the Basque Maker II period. So to give you an idea of how ubiquitous ground stone is, here is the distribution of isolated finds that we found on the ranch. And not surprisingly, they are strongly associated with where those Basque Maker II and archaic sites were located along especially Bell Cow Canyon. Uh, and we also found on Bell Cow Canyon uh, bedrock grinding features where they're actually using the bedrock as a matate and just bringing the mana with them to grind seeds that they're collecting nearby. Um, we also have found at uh, Rock Art Ranch uh, a pit house dating to the Basque Maker period, uh, indicating that they're spending a fair amount of time there because they're building uh, seasonal structures, and this is the pit house that we excavated at uh, that was associated or earlier than the, the Pueblo that we excavated there, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. These things are very shallow, had um, brush and pole superstructures. Um, they did, this one did not have a hearth in it, so it was probably used for storage and indicates that they were uh, probably not living here year round, but were staying here on a seasonal basis. And this would have been used for shelter and to store some of the, the uh, products that they were collecting on the ranch. So what we've found then um, in this very quick survey of about uh, 11,000 years, at Rock Art Ranch is this intensive focus on Chevron Bell Cow Canyons, um, where we find the unique natural resources concentrated. Um, we find uh, all the, of course, the petroglyph uh, production of 3,000 petroglyphs that occurs between um, 8,000 years ago, uh, extending up to um, 1250 AD, uh, we have this enormous concentration of projectile points from Clovis to the uh, introduction, introduction of pottery about 600 AD. Uh, so many of these are whole uh, that we, and they come from so many places um, and some are made out of local materials, some are from materials brought. Um, we wonder if they're in fact being lost or if they're not being left there purposely as part of what I discussed at the beginning as placemaking. Um, then we also find uh, between 800 BC and 600 AD concentrations of sites having thermal and non-thermal features in ground stone. The bat, these are the Basque Mako II period groups who have corn, but there's no indication that they are actually farming in the area. So it suggests that they're maybe using the ground stone to grind seeds. 
So all of this suggests that there is an extensive knowledge of this region um, that is being passed down through the generations of pre-ceramic groups and that this knowledge is by groups from all over the region about Rock Art Ranch. Uh, so these people are literally coming and going out of this area and um, sharing this knowledge with other groups and groups are returning and leaving evidence of their being there um, by their petroglyphs and by the projectile points that they leave. So again, uh, pre-ceramic sites, extensive at Rock Art Ranch, numbering almost 100, uh, focused on the canyons. Now I want to move into the uh, ceramic period at Rock Art Ranch, which lasts from about 600 to 1260 CE or AD. Um, and these ceramic groups are again coming from four different areas, four different directions. Um, and I'll talk about these in a little bit of detail, but these include Pueblo groups, what archeologists think of as Pueblo groups. Uh, descendants today are the Hopi in the area and the Zuni in uh, uh, West Central New Mexico. Uh, we have Sanawa groups who are prehistorically lived around the Flagstaff area. Um, we have what are called Puerto Valley groups who live in the areas around the Petrified Forest um, and along the upper Little Colorado. And then we have groups uh, coming from the, the uh, southeast that are Mugion groups that are making brown pottery um, and very distinctive uh, decorated pottery as well. So we have indications of all these groups coming into this area, trading with other groups in this area, and in some cases, establishing small settlements for a while. Um, the initial pottery making groups are called Basque Maker 3 and Pueblo 1 in the chronology we use in this area. And you can see their distribution is very different than the pre-ceramic groups. Um, these people are not focused along the canyons, although there are lots of sites along the canyons. They're spread out all over the place. And that's because these groups are farming groups. They're interested in land where they can grow corn, beans, and squash, and make a living growing those foods, rather than gathering and hunting in the area, which is much better resourced along the canyons. So some of these uh, sites are habitation sites. Uh, a lot of them are areas where they had little farms set up or associated with farmland. I might mention that the triangle on the far right side is where the current ranch headquarters are located. Uh, and still we have the blue square is the petroglyph site and the and the quarry areas for stone. This is the pottery that groups from the north were making. It's uh, called gray, gray ware because literally it is gray and that is the hallmark of Pueblo pottery. Um, initially, uh, the pottery was undecorated and that is part of what's the, called the Lino phase of uh, manufacture. This is a pottery type and a phase of occupation in the area. Uh, the Kana'a phase, 800 to 1,000, is what we see on the right side, and that's when they begin to decorate the pottery with black designs, and then begin to cover the surface with white slip. The designs are copied after basket designs, primarily. Um, and pottery is incredibly important because it allows groups to store food and cook food more efficiently. So it was a really important innovation in, uh, to the groups living in the area. Um, beginning about 1,000 to 1,050, um, these groups began more intensive use of the Rock Art Ranch area during what's called Pueblo II and Pueblo III, about 1050 to 1260. Um, and the farming was more intensive because more people were living in the area and they were living in the area for longer periods of time 
Um, the circle surrounds two sites that are called Brandy's Pueblo, which is two sites that we excavated and I'll be talking about in a little more detail soon. Um, this is a, a view of this small Pueblo, Brandy's Pueblo, made out of stone, occupied from about 1225 to 1255 based on a number of radiocarbon dates. And the surface that we see exposed full of holes are the features and the outdoor work areas used by these Pueblo groups. And these people were heavily committed to farming. And this is a uh, draw, plan view drawing of the Brandy's Pueblo. You can see it's quite small, had four rooms, probably had two families living in it that were kinship. They were related to one another. Um, and extensive outside work areas. They probably spent most of their time outside. And then uh, about 100 meters away is this uh, probable kiva underground room that they used for ceremonies uh, by this, these two families. Uh, this is the pottery that they uh, used at Brandy's Pueblo. Uh, the whiteware at the bottom comes from the south, southeast. The brown obliterated pottery on the lower right comes from that same area. And the pottery on the right, on the upper right, uh, comes more from the east. Um, so these groups are um, that settled Brandy's Pueblo were actually groups that migrated from the south and settled in this area in the early 1200s. So the idea of place uh, has shifted during the ceramic period. Farming communities um, during this the early part of the ceramic period um, focused on um, fairly local areas, Upper Bell Cow and Lower Chimney Canyons because of the unique resources in those areas that, that allowed intensive farming but by very small groups of people. Later on, as farming expanded and the, the commitment to farming intensified after a, a thousand AD, um, these groups focused only on Lower Chimney Canyon and those areas that were so popular by pre, for pre-ceramic groups, Lower Bell Cow, Chevron Canyons, were virtually not used at all. Uh, these groups also did very limited amount of petroglyph uh, carving in, in Chevron Canyon, unlike their basket maker and archaic groups. Um, so these uh, changes in priorities of place and importance of what, what is thought of as place and placemaking differed between farming ceramic producing groups from non-farming pre-ceramic groups in the area. Um, I want to shift back now just briefly to talk more about projectile points. I already um, suggested that projectile points found on the landscape are probably more than just lost. They probably represent placemaking and uh, what we call social memory. And that is um, that when somebody comes to a place, even like archeologists would come to a place, we find a point that tells us something about the people who were there earlier, where they came from, the material it's made out of might tell them an area they came through or where they came from. So there's a lot of information and that provides memory about the social uses of the landscape in the past. Uh, so it makes us realize that projectile points are probably more than just the remains of something that was shot at an animal and lost. Um, and we can turn to ethnographies to uh, maybe give us some clues about other purposes of, of points. Spear points primarily, arrow points, which are much smaller, less so. Um, ethnographies of uh, Pueblo and non-Pueblo groups indicate that points are often thought of as, as tips of lightning bolts. And because of that, 
they're used in rituals for rain, bringing rain, rain making. Um, and because of the power of these things being the tips of lightning bolts, they can only be handled by certain people who are members of certain religious societies. Um, they can also be thought of as amulets to improve hunting. So they might be collected uh, by somebody who has not had success in hunting or given to a young boy to help him um, improve his hunting. Um, and then they're also used uh, oftentimes to cut the umbilical cords of boys so they can become successful hunters. So uh, when we find points um, on the landscape, they may have one meaning, but we oftentimes find these late points on much later archaeological sites. Um, so these are called out of phase points because they are found in a much later context. So at Rock Art Ranch, uh, at sm these small pueblos like Brandy's Pueblo, we found a number of uh, large paleo and archaic points. Um, and at the uh, villages that I'll talk about here soon, Molovi and Chevron Pueblos, we find these points in kivas or in houses that are probably used by uh, religious leaders called clan and sodality houses in these villages. From all time periods, these points come from. Uh, and in addition to the points, they are found associated with uh, rare and unusual objects such as bird wings or bird heads, carnivores, deposits of ash. Um, and we have a a sense from looking at the array of points that are collected that they're being selected for certain styles, certain materials the points are made out of, including the color of the points, which are representative of uh, different directions or aspects of the landscape. Uh, so they may be representing these places as well uh, in their use as ritual objects. So this is a, a, a good example of uh, points uh, that were found in a kiva at a, what's called Chevlon Pueblo, which is about four miles from Rock Art Ranch. Uh, and this is from the filling of that kiva uh, between about 1330 and 1380. And just look at the amazing array of points that were found. These were not lost. These were purposely deposited in this kiva as offerings, perhaps for rain, perhaps um, to improve hunting, uh, maybe for other reasons that we don't know. Uh, again, note that almost all of them are whole. So they're being picked up and because they're whole and placed in the kiva, also, you'll notice in the lower left hand that uh, from a different kiva, we found a bunch of points that are made out of obsidian, which is a volcanic glass that is found uh, about 50 to 60 miles west of Rock Art Ranch in Chevron Pueblo. Um, and the color is probably important, as well as the fact that these points come from a San Francisco Peaks area areas that have uh, high elevations where there's lots of moisture and snow. Uh, so they probably have, again, much more meaning than just the fact they're points. And notice also that they're all whole. Okay, now we're gonna move on to uh, the area around the Hamulabi villages um, prior to the founding of those villages around 1260. Um, and this is going to just be a, a quick summary of that, of what the area looked like. Uh, all, the, all the settlements in the area where the big pueblos were founded beginning in 1260, the area was occupied by small uh, penthouse villages or pueblos, similar to what we found at Rock Art Ranch. Uh, each of these had two to five households and they were occupied for maybe a generation, just as Brandy's Pueblo was. Um, 
which would have been maybe 20 years. Most of these groups that we found in, in the Hamulabi area came from the Hopi Buttes, which is about 50 kilometers north. And they seem to have come to the uh, area, which is where the Little Colorado flows through, where there's a permanent flow of water during periods of drought. Uh, at most, there seem to have been maybe four settlements in the park in the early 1200s. Uh, again, these are pit houses, and I'll show you a pit house shortly. However, one pueblo was built of stone, uh, and that group who built that pueblo were the same groups that built Grandy's Pueblo, and they came from the south or southeast of the Hamulabi area. So there were interactions um, between groups from the north and groups from the south uh, in the Hamulabi area. So this is a, a map of that area um, with uh, indications of two of the big Hamulabi villages, Hamulabi 1 and Hamulabi 2 in blue, and two of the smaller villages that were occupied uh, between about 1150 and 1225. The site called HP 36 is a village of pit houses where like the pit basket maker two pit house that we saw earlier where they dug into the ground and uh, built a superstructure over that versus the Pueblo at Cresswell, which was similar to Brandy's Pueblo. So this is Cresswell Pueblo. Looks, as I said, very similar to Brandy's Pueblo. <clears throat> has four large masonry rooms and two smaller uh, masonry rooms. Most of the pottery is coming from the south and east. Uh, you can see a photo of some of that pottery. Uh, versus the penthouse village, HP 36, where over half of the pottery is coming from the north, indicating where these people probably came from. And this is a photograph of one of those pit houses, the one that's circled here, structure nine, um, square, fairly deep, and this might have been used both for um, living and also for some ceremonies. So very different um, occupation, but very small. Um, everything changed about 1260 and for a period of about 150 years to 1400 when thousands of people moved into the area. And uh, this is just a quick summary of the size and when some of these villages were occupied. You can see two of the villages have over a thousand rooms. Uh, another one, Chevron, the one we just talked about with the Kiva with the points in it, had 500 rooms, and the others are smaller. Uh, the first one occupied a mole before, about 1260, and three of them were occupied till about 1400. Um, so one of the things that um, we were interested in understanding is with these thousands of people coming into the area of the Little Colorado and make building these pueblos, where did they come from? So um, I've already talked a little bit about that um, with the basketry early on uh, with the, the basket maker groups coming in from the San Pedro area. But uh, we can also see this in how pottery is made, how kivas are designed, how rooms are built. All sorts of things are done unconsciously, uh, which means that uh, we are, in this case, these people are trained how to uh, make baskets, how to uh, construct pottery. They're trained by people in their community. So they make it in a way that is distinctive to their community. Um, and that most of that, those unique characteristics that they use to make that are hidden, are not really the obvious parts of making a pottery. Um, so uh, decorated pottery is uh, definitely a good indicator of that, but also undecorated pottery is a good indicator of that. And I'll have some examples here. 
So um, the pottery on the left side called Tucson Polychrome is a tradition that was made in uh, Northeastern Arizona. And that tradition is uh, copied very closely by the pottery on the lower right side, which is called Winslow Orange Ware. And that's the pottery that was being made at the uh, Mullaby villages. So that pottery making tradition and design was brought to the Mullaby villages from the north, it seems. Um, and uh, they simply used local clays to make a pot pottery that looks very similar to the Tucson polychrome pottery. Uh, that tradition continued in the making of yellow pottery, which is uh, made on the Hopi mesas uh, still today. Uh, those are located about 60 miles north of the Homolabi area, but they continued to make a very similar uh, tradition of uh, decorating of their pottery, at least early on in the early to mid 1300s, uh, what's called Jedido Yellowware, uh, Jedido being the name of the area around Hopi. Um, uh, the color yellow is uh, obtained by the distinctive clays that are used in that area when they're heated, they turn this kind of light yellow color. Um, one of the things that we discovered fairly late in our analysis of pottery is that there are two very distinctive ways of making corrugated pottery. And now corrugated pottery is, uh, I'll show you a slide of corrugated pots. Um, this is the utility pottery and the exterior designs are called corrugations. And those are probably decorative primarily. They, if they have a function, it is not as sig significant. It could help in gripping it. Um, it might help in enhancing heating, but it seems primarily to be decorative. And there are two styles. There's the style on the left, which is kind of vertically oriented versus a style on the right where the corrugations are aligned at a slant. Well, it turns out that those two traditions are distinctive to two areas of manufacture of corrugated pottery. One on the left is what's called Tucson, and it is made to the north of the Homolabi area versus the one on the right which is um, muggy and obliterated corrugated or brown obliterated corrugated, which is made by groups of people to the south and east, the muggy people. And this is the type of pottery we found at Brandy's Pueblo and Cresswell Pueblo. The Tucson corrugated pottery is what we found at HP 36. So these true traditions, um, persisted for hundreds of years side by side. And what we found is that both of those traditions continued side by side in the villages at Homolavi, um, with about 25% of the corrugated pottery being the brown corrugated from the south and 75% being uh, this gray corrugated from the north, which suggests that rather than 100% of the people at the Homolabi villages coming from the north, perhaps 75% of them came from the north, another 25% came from the south. And the reason that the people from the south were hidden is because they did not have a robust tradition of decorating pottery. And so when you only looked at the decorated pottery, it obscured uh, the contributions of the people from the south. So again, uh, the corrugated tradition from the north is on the left and the one from the south is on the right. Um, and you can see it, there continue to be gray and brown uh, typically also. Another uh, group of people who showed up in the Molaby villages, in particular in the village of Shevlon, are groups 
um, from the south and east who were making what's called salado polychromes. <clears throat> and this tradition is very distinctive. Um, and these designs began showing up on pottery that was being made locally around 1375. And that indicates that groups with the knowledge of how to make this pottery migrated from areas um, where this pottery sh shows up earlier into the Chevlon Mulvey area um, later on and used local clays to make uh, pottery with identical designs. So um, this is a summary of those traditions. The uh, Tucson grayware, uh, general orangeware, and yellowware groups bringing their technology from the north. Perhaps 75% of the people coming into the Homolabi Chevron area, with 25% uh, of them migrating uh, from the south and southeast, making the brown ware corrugated and also bringing in the late decorated wares uh, after 1375. Other things that um, were brought into the area um, from the north are construction patterns. This is called ladder construction. Uh, Pueblos at Homolabi and really all over the Four Corners region after 1275 or so began to use what's called ladder construction. And um, it is, uh, if you look at the layout of the uh, walls, the two dark colored walls are parallel A and B, and they are built parallel to each other for 10 meters, 20 meters, 50 meters. And then the interior walls are built later to subdivide these spaces equally. This is a much quicker way of building uh, villages and was used efficiently when large groups of people were coming into areas. Um, and they also could have been used if people were concerned about their safety to build these large fortifications early on. Uh, up above, you can see uh, two, two story expressions of how these communities looked um, and how they were accessed using ladders. So an example of uh, this kind of construction could be found at Humolvi 1 the South uh, Plaza area, which was built very rapidly, long room blocks, uh, reconstruction of what that village might have looked like is in the uh, lower right. And this um, set of rooms was probably built in a matter of maybe 10 years or so, at least the, the main spines of these room blocks. Uh, also, I should point out that those were used to surround open spaces or plazas, which were communal gathering areas uh, for groups that were important for um, not only people to get together to uh, talk, but also for ceremonies. And uh, in, the, in the corner of that plaza, where my arrow is, is a kiva, where ceremonies would be held as well. And this is what uh, the interiors of that kiva might look like. And kiva design is also something that is distinctive uh, from the north, uh, a style that we see in Hopi Mesa villages of the same time period, square or rectangular, um, stone floors, stone walls for the most part. Um, and they typically have alignments of holes on the floor. And this is where looms were um, put up when the, the kivas were not being used for ceremonies. And the same thing is done today in kivas at Hopi, where uh, when they're not being used for ceremonies, there are holes in the floor that vertical looms are set up for men to do weaving. It also shows that uh, these are underground and that they were roofed over and the ladder uh, in the reconstructed uh, Kiva on the right was how you access the interior of these kivas. Uh, this is a large kiva. Um, and these really large kivas are associated with um, Mugion groups to the south. 
So not all Kiva architecture perhaps came from the north with the uh, Hopi area. Uh, some of it may have also come from groups bringing that um, brown corrugated pottery with them from the south and building a large Kiva like this. Uh, those people, by the way, are about uh, six feet or two meters long. And uh, this is just another example, a larger view example of what these kivas would look like, these larger kivas. Roof entry, give you an idea of what the roofs look like. Uh, looms set up when they're not being used for uh, ceremonies. So uh, I've already pretty much given away the farm on this. Um, these traits of uh, pottery design and manufacture, both painted and corrugated, um, kiva construction, um, design of the villages are strongly associated with groups living to the north. Um, however, uh, we also fairly recently in the last five years or so have come to appreciate that there's an important group of people who also came from the south. So these are uh, multi-ethnic communities, but people who have really known each other, even though uh, they, they have lived in different areas of the, the southern Colorado Plateau, they've interacted with each other for thousands of years. So they finally, in these pueblos, actually started living together. So um, these are um, sort of the neighborhoods that the Himolavi villages uh, were interacting with, um, with uh, Pueblo groups uh, occupying uh, areas around them. And we have pottery and other material culture from these different areas, indicating that, again, um, groups from all around the Himolavi area are interacting with groups in the Himolavi area. Uh, finally, I um, uh, want to talk a little bit about people leaving this area uh, and uh, when they did and, and perhaps why they did. Uh, one of, some of our best indicators of people leaving are burning of rooms. And this is uh, the village of Chevlon, which I've talked a, a bit about off and on. Um, much of Chevlon was burned when the people left. And the indications are, and I won't go into that in detail here, uh, that it was burned by people living there. There's no indication of outside attack. Um, um, that it was a very orderly leaving of the village and most of the rooms that were burned were either um, there was nothing on the floors or what was on the floor was carefully um, placed on the floors. So uh, some of the rooms were burned using uh, corn, others uh, just the roof was burned and they collapsed onto the floors and the map on the left side shows the areas that we know were burned. Um, and some of the assemblages uh, that we found on the floors or in the floors um, of burned rooms, uh, things that were um, just left on the floors or in the floors purposely by people because we believe that when they left, virtually all these people moved back to the Hopi area. And that is 60 miles away and you really can't carry very much when you move 60 miles, you would carry maybe some seed, corn, water and food, religious objects and everything else would be left behind. So it's left on the floors. Uh, another ex indication that uh, of people leaving an area and, and leaving footprints, which I started this uh, talk talking about Hopi footprints and how they purposely left material behind. Here is a really good example of that at the village of Homolavi One, where we have uh, three bowls and, and out of many that we found at Homolavi One that were broken on purpose. And what they did is they turned the bowl upside down and they struck it with a rock. And so the area arrows point at fractures in the pot 
that indicate where they were struck and broken. And then they were just left there basically as whole pots, but broken into 10 or 20 or 50 pieces. And these were left at the very top of the cultural fill of rooms, basically the last things that were left there before the people left. So hope you talk about breaking pottery uh, when they leave villages uh, to show people who had lived there before and to all sort of stake a claim that this is our home, our ancestors are buried here, so uh, leave this place alone and continue on your way. Um, so when people left the Homolavi area, um, vast majority of them migrated up to the Hopi area, which is uh, in the villages there, pri pri primarily on the villages on the right side numbered 13 to 19, uh, with a few possibly moving to Zuni, those people that made the muggy on brown ware and the Roosevelt red wares and things like that, those people were more closely associated with Zuni um, and maybe some of them went to Zuni as well. But that's where the descendants live today. And both communities, both Hopi and Zuni, especially Hopi, have strong oral traditions about the people who lived at Homolavi um, and groups identify with them at Hopi today. Um, and then I just want to follow up with continued connections. Even after people left the Homolavi area around 1400, we continue to find indications that, people, that Hopi and some Zuni came back to the area. And we find that in particular at Rock Art Ranch. And these squares are places where we found yellow pottery. Again, yellow pottery is made only at Hopi. And the one that's circled, I have a, a slide a little later on of a pot that we found there. Uh, <clears throat> this pottery is primarily dated post Homolabi between 1400 and 1700 indicating that these groups, Hopi groups, were coming and visiting this area, probably primarily Chevron Canyon. Um, and there are some late petroglyphs uh, that date to this period in the canyon, very few, so they weren't doing much carving of petroglyphs, but they were leaving offerings of pottery and in some cases obsidian in the area. Um, indicating that this is an ancestral area and that's important to them in terms of their identity. And then this is that pot that we found uh, in probably four or 500 pieces. Thank you to the conservators at Arizona State Museum for putting this much of it together. Um, this vessel may date closer to 1600 AD than uh, earlier based on uh, the design on the bottom and the neck banding, but it's always hard to date single pots. So uh, getting close to the end here, um, placemaking during the Homolabi occupation and beyond from about 1260 to 1700. Um, the Pueblo people living in these communities embrace the deep history of the area and the people who inhabited it by collecting objects or later on revisiting these places. They re recognized the distinctive features of the area, which included permanent flows of water in the Chevron and Little Colorado River, which they don't have at Hopi or at Zuni, although that there is some flow of water at Zuni. Uh, the prominent numerous buttes, uh, especially at Homolavi, uh, which is the, what the Hopi call homols that are covered with petroglyphs, the deep canyons with unique plants and animals and ancient glyphs, some of which have permanent water in them. Uh, also uh, identifying safe places for crossing the river. Collectively, through this 13,000 year history, they created a landscape that was essential to sustaining ancestral and modern Hopi culture. And this landscape preserves the history of this movement through all the footprints 
that were left behind that's so much a part of Hopi history and ethnography today. And just want to say thanks to um, all the groups and the people and the institutions that supported the research. Uh, School of Anthropology, the Arizona State Museum, of course, National Science Foundation, Earthwatch, and Brantley Baird, who owns Rock Art Ranch, and all the field schools and graduate students and volunteers who helped make this possible. So thank you all.